Next, I want to focus on electrolyte solutes. So, what is an electrolyte? Well, on the left side there is uh, Svante Arrhenius. And so, Arrhenius was a uh, chemist, a Swedish chemist from years ago. Uh, his name lends itself to uh, the Arrhenius expression. There is an Arrhenius activation energy. He did a great deal of work. And some of his work was on, uh, on electrolytes. And in particular, what he said was, that salts of strong acids and bases separate into their constituent ions when they're in solution. It turns out, you and I know that and have probably learned it since we were in first grade, perhaps. At the time Arrhenius proposed it, it was considered extremely controversial. So controversial that he was pilloried by other chemists uh, around the world, one of whom I'm, I'm particularly fond of, Armstrong, who was a British chemist at the time. And he was so offended at this idea that he wrote a letter to the uh, sort of magazine of chemists that circulated in, in uh, the UK at the time. And uh, I'm going to read it out loud just because I really like it, but uh, it's an indication of how strongly people can take their scientific views, if you like. The fact is, there has been a split of chemistry into two schools since the intrusion of the arenic faith. Rather, it should be said, the addition of a new class of worker into our profession. People without knowledge of the laboratory arts and with sufficient mathematics at their command to be led astray by curvilinear agreements. Without the ability to criticize, still less of giving any chemical interpretation. The fact is, the physical chemists never use their eyes and are most lamentably lacking in chemical culture. It is essential to cast out from our midst, root and branch, this physical element and return to our laboratories. You know, I am a physical chemist. I, I take that a little personally, uh, to be completely honest. Uh, the good news is that Arrhenius was right, uh, and Armstrong is going to live with this for all the rest of history. So, uh, a nice quote from chemical history in any case. So let's, from a general standpoint, talk about how one deals with electrolytes when one is interested in their thermodynamics. So let me define a generic electrolyte, Mn, so it's two species, uh, positively charged species and negatively charged species. When I add it into solution, it will, I'm going to have X and Y be my actual ions. And they will be in proportion, this is a subscript that tells you how many, right? So it, one, two, three, how many of those positively charged ions to how many of the negatively charged ions. Because the ions themselves can carry charges that are not necessarily unity. Right? So it separates into R plus of the cation, which has a charge of X plus, and it separates into S minus of the anion Y, which has a charge of Y minus. And what we do know is that from electroneutrality, R plus times X, that is the total amount of positive charge, must be equal to S minus times Y, the total amount of negative charge. But I'll make the negative charge negative, so when I sum these two, it equals zero. Right, so that's charge neutrality. We know that we can't, you can't make a solution that's all cations or, or all anions. And so that actually poses a, a little bit of a challenge in a sense. So if we think about the chemical potential of a salt, mu2, so two because it's still a solute, when I dissolve it into solution, it is the sum of unknowable chemical potentials, truly unknowable, because I can't make a solution of the pure cation or of the pure anion. Nevertheless, I can at least discuss them. So it'll be R plus, because there's that many of them, times the chemical potential of the cation, plus S minus, there's that many of them, times the chemical potential of the anion. And now I expand these chemical potentials in the usual way. So this one is a hypothetical standard state chemical potential plus RT log and activity. And so too, I can do exactly the same thing with the cation and with the anion. And that implies then, in terms of the activities, that log of A2 is going to be R plus log of this one, plus S minus log of this one. And from properties of logarithms, I can 
kind of collect these things. This is uh, a, a, well, I don't know what to say, property of logarithms, that's right. So if you uh, play around with things times logs, you get things to positive powers and sums of logs are like logs of products. So I'll let you do this rearrangement to convince yourself. And it lets us define then something called the mean ionic activity. So this first equality just consists of doing some rearrangements of terms and using properties of logarithms. Now I'm going to define a new quantity, a plus minus, called the mean ionic activity, with the goal of a plus minus raised to these powers, the sum of the numbers of anions and, sorry, of anions over here and cations, is equal to a2. All right? and you know, this is in principle, uh, has a physical meaning, even though we can't ever make those solutions. Uh, so, and this has a value that we can potentially measure. So in any case, this is something that could be measured as well. All right, so I'm gonna uh, just move that to the next slide and continue by analogy. Uh, actually, this is uh, the analog of what was on the last slide. So on the last slide we had Oh, I, I did move it. Okay, well, once more, an outtake. Um, so this is moving from the last slide. And by analogy, we can define a mean ionic molality and activity coefficient. So A2 is a molality times an activity. So I'm going to define A plus minus as a molality times an activity coefficient. It'll become more clear why I might want to do that in a moment. Okay, where they follow exactly the same rules, right? So this... Uh, m plus minus raised to these powers is equal to the molalities of the individual pieces, and gamma plus minus raised to these powers is the product of the individual gammas. And so what one has then is that given a starting compound molality, that is I'll measure out a certain mass of a salt, and because it's the salt I'll continue to think of it as being the combination of the cations and the anions then A2, the activity coefficient of the solute, is going to be equal to that initial molality M. So if it's uh, sodium chloride, it will weigh something like, uh, I'm uh, not sure I'll have that memorized right off the top of my head, 85, something along those lines. Um, I can weigh out one mole's worth of sodium chloride. That would be one added to a kilogram, for example, times r plus to the r plus power times s minus to the s minus power times gamma plus minus raised to the r plus plus s minus power. And uh, if that seems to have come out of nowhere, I'm actually going to let you derive it a bit. And that is, given this definition, we actually defined what m plus minus was, verify that m plus minus is equal to this quantity, because that's actually what happened here. I expanded this m plus minus into m, the original compound molality, r plus plus s minus, r plus to the r plus, s minus to the s minus. And then I just carried this gamma plus minus and kept it. So let's play with that self-assessment. And then moreover, um, you know, this was very general and there seemed to be a lot of variable names floating around and sometimes it's just helpful to conceptualize things to really pick a specific example. So let's actually take the example of having one mole of aluminum sulfate and we'll assume it's a strong electrolyte, so it separates completely in water, added to one kilogram of water. For that case, determine every variable here. Determine what's R plus, what's X plus, what's M, uh, and what's S minus. Okay. So here's the explanation for that. I'll, I'll let you pause for a moment and uh, see if you corresponded to all the various numbers, and then we'll move on. All right, well, determining electrolyte activity, we've actually already discussed how to determine solute activity. And really, determining electrolyte activity is exactly the same process. There's one little change. And so if you recall, we had this interesting device where we measure the vapor pressure of the solvent and it, it's very important that we work with the solvent here because salts have no vapor pressure whatsoever. Sort of by definition, you can't take an ion out of the, out of the solution by itself. And ionic species usually do not want to leave 
They have big charge separations. They don't want to go up in the gas phase where charge is poorly uh, stabilized. They want to be in solution where they can interact with other things. So they have vanishingly small vapor pressures uh, way below detection limits. But you can look at as you add them to the solution and they affect the activity of the solvent, that gives you a measure of their own activities. And so you follow ex the, exactly the same equations we saw for determining solute activity for non-electrolytes. Namely, log of the activity of the solvent is roughly log of the mole fraction because of Raoul's law behavior. By definition of mole fraction, it's log of one minus mole fraction of the solute. For a small mole fraction, the log is equal to minus the mole fraction of the solute. And when we convert mole fraction to molality, we'll get M over 55.51 moles per kilogram. If we're working in water, you'd, you'd need a different number if it were a different liquid. But the one little wrinkle here is my compound separated into its ions. So instead of being the molality of what I took out of a bottle, which was a solid and had the ions considered to be together, I have now separated into ions. So instead of being molal in the salt itself, let's say it was sodium chloride, it is one molal in sodium and one molal in chloride. And so there is a total of two molal in stuff, ions, if you like. And so that's just given by adding R plus and S minus, which remember was kind of the stoichiometric values of how the salt is constituted. So once again, I can look at deviation from ideality as I measure variations in this activity coefficient, define that, that not a coefficient, sorry, activity, define phi as a measure of that deviation, and uh, tabulate things. I do exactly the same integration I did a few videos ago. I won't show that again in order to work out what's the activity coefficient of the solute but more interestingly, perhaps, what are the effects on colligative properties? So molality, once more, of compound is just multiplied by how many things it separates into. And so one that we know very commonly is uh, there was a, uh, one of the self-assessments was how much sugar do you need to add to water in order to depress the freezing point? And it turns out you have to add scads of the stuff. And of course, partly that's because it's, it's got a high molecular weight and it's one thing. It's a sugar molecule. If I add salt, on the other hand, sodium chloride, it doesn't weigh very much, and importantly, it separates into two things. So right away, sodium chloride gives me a factor of two in a, a freezing point depression compared to a non-electrolyte species like sugar. And many of you may know that on particularly cold days here in Minnesota, if you want to melt ice still more effectively, you may put down calcium chloride. So those are the little white, uh, pearly, round nuggets as opposed to the chunky pieces of table salt, sodium chloride. Why would you do that? Well, because calcium chloride separates into one calcium cation, but two chloride anions. So now you've got a factor of three out front here, and you can, in principle, lower the freezing point even further. We're dictated by how much we can actually get to go into solution. So you can't lower the freezing point as far as you might like in Minnesota. But that's why salts are used for these purposes. All right, and osmotic pressure, on the other hand, that's the one that works against you to some extent. So that's why desalinating seawater requires more pressure because you've separated into constituent things instead of what would happen for a non-electrolyte. All right, so that's uh, kind of the introduction to electrolytes. What we're going to do next is actually look at a theory that tells us from first principles what should be the activity coefficient gamma plus minus for any electrolyte when it's sufficiently dilute. And that's Debye-Huckel theory, and we'll do that next.